All right, dust off an Old Testament book by the name of Nehemiah. Nehemiah, and I won't even call your name out loud if I see you looking in the table of contents in order to find it. Find the book of Nehemiah. If you want to take a pew Bible and use it this morning, please do. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, I would encourage you to take a pew Bible and open that pew Bible to page 400. If you want to use the pew Bible, I'll give you the page number. It's 400. The Old Testament book of Nehemiah. Lots of pages turning. That's a good sound. But if 15 minutes they're still turning, that's a bad sound. <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 4. Page 400 if you're using the Pew Bible. And as we always do, I covet your prayers, and so I, I want you to pray for me. And I'm going to give you time to do that in just a moment. We're going to be silent and... You pray for me that I can deliver the message God's laid on my heart to share with you. And then would you do something else? Would you pray for yourself? That the Lord would take the words that I'm going to say and speak to your heart about where you are with Him this morning. What your relationship is with Him. I don't know, but, but the Lord does. And He can use my words to speak to your situation today. So pray for yourself. Let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for the opportunity to stand and share your word today, and I pray that your spirit would just speak through me. Father, the people may hear and see the treasure, not the vessel, and that your word would be clear in the heart and life of every person. Father, show us this morning from your word how to handle the criticisms that oftentimes come our way, the critics that are in our lives. In Christ's name that I, I pray, amen. I do want to talk this morning about handling criticism. Have you ever been criticized? Ever had your actions called into question? Ever had your motives maligned? Ever had somebody tell you that you're doing a lousy job? Or somebody say, why don't you do this? Or why don't you stop doing that? Have you ever felt the sting of unfair accusations, half-truths, and even downright lies? Good for you. Because that means you're alive. And it means you're doing well. From Mother Teresa to Nelson Mandela to the Wright brothers to Steve Jobs, every person who has ever achieved great things has had critics. And you will have yours too. It's been said if you're getting kicked in the rear, that simply means you're out in front. And you need to accept the fact that some people are just never going to celebrate the beauty of you. They're just not going to do it. They are never going to appreciate you. They are never going to recognize your gifts. They are never going to sing your praises. And that's okay. Here's how you avoid criticism. Say nothing. Do nothing. Be nothing. Aristotle said that, and he was right. Criticism is inevitable, especially if you are a leader. If you lead any group, whether that be a business or a corporation or a football team or a restaurant or an office or a store or a school or a church or even a family, if you lead any group, expect 
criticism. The key is learning how to deal with it. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. I want to show you two men from the scriptures, Nehemiah and David. Both leaders, both had their critics, did they ever. I want us to look at two scenes from each of their lives. So here's what we're going to do this morning. I'm going to walk you through two scenes from the life of Nehemiah, two scenes from the life of David. In all of these scenes, these men are being criticized. We will learn the historical events, and then we will go back and learn some truth about critics and how we can handle them. So, let's begin here in Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1, let me begin reading. Now, when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and the burned ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and, and he said, Yes, what they are building, if a fox goes on it, he will break down their stone wall. Hear, O God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out from your sight. For they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. So we built the wall. And all the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry and they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. And we prayed to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. Nehemiah had a task, and that is to rebuild the wall around the city of Jerusalem. If you know your Old Testament history, you know that Israel had been in exile in Babylon for 70 years. God had predicted that, and now that 70 years was coming to a close, and he was going to bring his people back into the promised land. He was going to bring his people back into their homeland, and the wall around the city of Jerusalem was in rubble. The wall around the city of Jerusalem was just nothing but heaps of rocks. And Nehemiah's job was to build a wall around the city of Jerusalem. Now that may not sound very spiritual to you, but that is the task that God had given him. That is God's will for his life. This was his divine assignment. Rebuild the wall, Nehemiah, around the city of Jerusalem. This was his divine assignment for this moment. And here comes the critics. Sanballat, angry, enraged, and jeering. What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they finish up in a day? And then it was Tobiah's turn. And there is sarcasm in verse 3. Yes, what, what are they building? It, if a fox jumps on top of it, it will topple. It, 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 it will fall. Now, how does Nehemiah face his opposition? The first thing he does is pray. If you'll notice that in verse 4 and again in verse 9, he prays. Hear, O our God, for we are despised. And in verse 9, and we prayed to our God. But look at his prayer in verse 4. Turn back their taunt on their own heads, God, and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out from your eyes. Do you know what he's praying? Sick them, God. That's what he's telling God to do with his critics. Sick them, God. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. But here's where we get in trouble. When we play sick'em, 
Nehemiah prayed, God, you sick them. Not Nehemiah. You don't sick them, dear friends. You don't take revenge. You don't get your friends even to take revenge. You leave your critics to God. You leave them in His hands. The worst thing you can do is you fight every critic one by one. And then after he prayed, Nehemiah stayed at the task. Look at verse 6. Verse 6 says, so we built the wall. I love that. Here we are, we got critics harping at us. Telling us what we can and cannot do. We built the wall. He just persisted at the task. He just kept on doing what God had called him to do. He knew it was God's will. He had a spiritual assignment. He stayed with the task and he persisted through. Now, turn over maybe a page to the sixth chapter of Nehemiah. If you're in the Pew Bible, that is just one page. It's page 401. Look at chapter 6 in Nehemiah verse 1. Sometimes your critics just won't go away. And here in chapter 6, we find Sanballat and Tobiah, and they've even added a friend to their number, Geshem. Look at Nehemiah chapter 6 verse 1. Now when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set up the doors in the gates. Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, Come and let us meet together at... And I'm not going to try to pronounce that. Let's just call it Winfield, okay? Come let us meet together at Winfield in the plain of Ono. But they intended to do me harm. And I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work and cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in this way, and I answered them in the same manner. In the same way, Sanballat for the fifth time sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. This time it wasn't a private message. This time it was an open letter for everybody to read. Verse 6 gives us the contents of that open letter. In it was written, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. That is why you're building the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. And you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. And now the king will hear of these reports. So now come and let us take counsel together. Then I sent to him saying, No such things as you say have been done, for you are inventing them out of your own mind for they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work and it will not be done. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. As I said, sometimes your critics just don't give up. And so here's Sanballat and Tobiah again, and they have recruited another critic. His name is Geshem. And, and they said to Nehemiah, come meet with us on the plain of Ono. And Nehemiah said, Oh no! to the meeting at Ono because he refused to get sidetracked I love what he says in verse 3 find this expression in verse 3 find the expression I've underlined it I've yellow highlighted it in my Bible I am doing a great work and cannot come down that's the answer you need sometimes that, to give to your critics that's his perspective. That's what he's doing. He's doing a great work. And he refuses to be sidetracked by the critics. They sent, five, they sent five requests to Nehemiah and he refused every one of them. As I said a moment ago, the fifth one came in the form of an open letter, not a private request. It was probably an embossed invitation with lovely printing, but it was open for everyone to read and see. And you can see the contents there, what they were accusing Nehemiah of doing. The Jews intend to rebel. You're going to become their king. You even set up prophets in Jerusalem to say, Nehemiah is the king. Nehemiah is going to be king. Nehemiah is going to be king. There's a great Hebrew word for verses 6 and 7. Baloney. Baloney. 
none of that is true. His critics have made it up. None of that is true. Verse 6 says, it is reported among the nation. That's the way rumors and false information always begin. Well, well, I heard. Somebody said. Sources are never named. Nehemiah, you know what I heard? I, I, I heard you came for the express purpose of collecting a group of people around you so you can lead a revolution and you want to be their king and you're spreading prophets throughout the land to say that you want to be their king. All of that is inaccurate information. The Jews don't want to rebel. Nehemiah is not seeking to be their king. But his actions and his motives are called into question. And again, Nehemiah prayed. And Nehemiah stayed at the task. He persisted. He continued to do what God had called him to do. Now, back up to 2 Samuel. And, and I say back up because that's what you're going to have to do in your Bible. You're going to have to back up through First and Second Chronicles, although it's Second Chronicles and First Chronicles because you're backing up. And then you're going to have to back up through Second Kings and First Kings, but you're going to eventually find Second Samuel chapter 16 and verse 5. If you're in a pew Bible, that's on page 268. 268 if you're in a pew Bible, but back yourself up to 2 Samuel chapter 16, verse 5. As I said, I want to show you two scenes out of the life of Nehemiah and now two scenes out of the life of David when they're being criticized. 2 Samuel chapter 16, verse 5. When King David came to Baharim, there came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. And as he came out, he cursed continually, and he threw stones at David, and at all the servants of King David, and all the people, and all the mighty men who were on his right hand and on his left. And Shimei, as he cursed said, get out, get out, you man of blood, you worthless man. The Lord has avenged on you all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose place you have reigned, and the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. See, your evil is on you. You are a man of blood. Then Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, said to the king, why should this dead dog curse my Lord the King? Let me go over there and take off his head. But the king said, What have I to do with you, you sons of Zerah? If he's cursing because the Lord has said to him, Curse David, who then shall say, Why have you done so? And David said to Abishai and to all his servants. Behold, my own son seeks my life. How much more now may this Benjamite leave him alone and let him curse? For the Lord has told him to. It may be that the Lord will look upon the wrong done to me and that the Lord will repay me with good for his cursing today. So David and his men went down the road while Shimei went along on the hillside opposite them and cursed as he went and threw stones at him and flung dust. Can you get that scene? There's David and his men walking along a road. There's Shimei up on a hill beside the road there and he's kicking dirt down on them and he's throwing stones down on them and he's cursing them. And verse 14 says, And the king and all the people who were with him arrived weary at the Jordan. I bet they did. Weary. David has never been lower in his life. The personal situation in David's life right now is that he has never been lower. He is at rock bottom. His family has turned against him. His son Absalom has usurped the throne and is now reigning as king. And David is on the run, literally. His own son is trying to kill him. His own son's out to take his life. David is at the lowest ebb. Physically, and emotionally. And a man named Shimei comes out of nowhere to add to his misery. He's throwing rocks at David, literally. 
Rock after rock after rock after rock. And then listen to what he says in verse 6 and 7. Excuse me, verse 7 and 8. I want to read it out of the New Living Translation. Get out of here, you murderer, you scoundrel, he shouted at David. The Lord is paying you back for murdering King Saul and his family. That was a lie. You stole the throne. That's another lie. And now the Lord has given it to your son Absalom. That's a third lie. The Lord never gave the throne to David's son Absalom. Absalom took the throne. At last you will taste some of your own medicine, you murderer. Do you see a pattern here? Critics deal in half-truth and rumor... And sometimes even lies. David is at his lowest and along comes Shemai and boom, he hits him below the belt. Boom, there's another verbal blow, verbal blow below the belt. Boom, one, one more time and then one of David's men, Abishai, can't take it anymore. And, and look what he wants to do in verse 9. Verse 9 says, why should that dead dog curse my Lord? Let me go over there and take off his head. Now that's just a pretty direct game plan if you ask me. David, let me at him. I'll cut off his head so fast he won't know it until he tries to scratch his nose. You don't have to take this, David. Let me handle him. Yes, Shemai's throwing rocks at David. Yes, he's lied about David. Yes, he's personally attacked David. And you notice how David responded? Let's just leave him and let God deal with him. God may be telling him to curse me. And then again, maybe God will see the wrong that's being done to me and bless me for it. Let's just leave him to God. I'm sorry, Pepper Purrier would never respond that way. That is an amazing study in self-control. David didn't get offended. He didn't even yell. How in the world can he not yell? David simply says, leave him to God. He may be doing what God told him to do. Or maybe the Lord will see the wrong that he's done. The wrong way he's treating me. And the Lord will bless me for it. So again, notice the ending. They arrived weary. Wow, now that's what critics do to us, don't us? Don't it? Critics wear us out. So, what can we learn about critics? I've got it on the screen for you. I want to show you three things. First of all, critics feel threatened by what you're trying to accomplish. Critics feel threatened by what you're trying to accomplish. We see this in the persons of Sanballat and Tobiah, Nehemiah's critics. There was anger, there was rage, and there was even a little bit of sarcasm. Why? Because the status quo was being threatened. Why? Because progress was being made. Why? Because change was taking place. New ideas were being introduced. Success was occurring. And critics feel threatened by what you're trying to accomplish. The second thing. Critics often don't have their facts straight. We see this in both Nehemiah and David's critics. Critics take a kernel of truth and run with it. And they jump to their own conclusions. They embellish the facts to support their own cause. And thereby questioning your motives. Your judgment is second guessed. All based on things that are not true. And the worst thing is, is they publish them in open letters. And then gullible listeners believe it. They believe these critics and then they pass it on and it turns out to be something that is grossly inaccurate. Sanballat, Tobiah, Shimei, none of them had their facts straight. 
critics need to get their facts straight. And then the third thing is, critics will blindside you. Hitting you when you least expect it. It's not that you don't expect criticism. It's that a critic's timing is always lousy. From your point of view. From your perspective. It's always at the worst possible moment in your own life. For David, it was when he was going through a personal crisis, a personal low, and the critic struck, making things go from bad to worse. Critics can hit you at your lowest moments, and that's what makes you weary. So, how do you handle your critics? How do you respond to criticism? What do you do when you're criticized? What, what would be a biblical response to criticism? So, let's begin our point of application this way. With prayer and patient persistence, don't let your critics sidetrack you. With prayer and patient persistence, don't let your critics sidetrack you. Every leader must develop the ability to measure the value of criticism. Every leader must develop the ability to measure the worth of the criticism he is receiving. You have to determine the source. You have to determine the motive. You have to listen to the criticism with discernment. And that is where prayer comes into play. And sometimes the right thing to do is simply ignore the criticism and move forward. Nehemiah ignored it five times and just kept moving forward. I love Nehemiah's approach to his critics. He did two significant things. He prayed and he persisted. Nehemiah, come down here. Nehemiah, come meet with us. Nehemiah, you'll never finish that wall. Nehemiah, you don't have what it takes. Nehemiah, you need to come have a meeting with us. But Nehemiah stayed focused. He had his eyes on the Lord. He was patient with his critics and persisted in the task at hand. And he called it a great work. He said, I'm doing a great work here. It's the work God has called me to do. He has given me this vision. He has given me this dream. And Nehemiah was disciplined enough not to get sidetracked. With prayer and patient persistence, you don't let your critics sidetrack you. Look at that word prayer. You fight your battles through prayer. I know, the first thing you want to do is retaliate. That's because as a leader, you have a strong will. As a leader, you are a strong-willed personality. And it's quite human for you to want to punch back. But you fight your critics through prayer. You don't punch out their lights. That's what you want to do. But before you respond to your critics, talk to God... Fight your critics on your knees. Let him handle them. And now the two words, patient, persistence. You have to accept the fact that not everybody's going to support you. Not everybody's going to like you. Not everybody's going to understand you. That's, that's okay. David experienced that with Shemai. But he exercised patience. He didn't retaliate against Shemai. He exercised persistence. How did David remain patient? How did David remain persistent? Despite all that Shemai was doing and had said to him. Because David had a soft heart and thick skin. And leaders have to have both. I had a college professor tell me. Well, he didn't tell me. Actually, he told a group of preacher boys what he called us. He said, all right, all you preacher boys, I'm going to tell you something. If you're going to go out there and pastor a church, you're going to need two things. I got out my pen and paper. He said, you're going to need the heart of a dove, and you're going to need the hide of an elephant. And that's exactly right. If you're a leader, you're going to need the heart of a dove, and you're going to need the hide of an elephant. Because there are Shemites out there by the dozen. And their spiritual gift is criticism. 
That's their spiritual gift. To tell you what it is you're doing wrong. And those people who get the job done are those people who are able to overlook the hurtful comments from people because you've got the hide of an elephant. If you're called into leadership, you have to be thick-skinned, soft-hearted. With prayer and patient persistence, don't let your critics sidetrack you. Stay at the task. Don't you give up. You keep building. You, you just do it with the hide of an elephant and the, and the heart of a dove. Now let me show you one more scene out of David's life. I promised you two scenes out of David's life. And it goes to the point of will you be offended or not. It goes to the point of will you throw rocks back at your Shemites or not. Or will you be big enough to forgive and not hold a grudge. Would you just move forward three chapters. First Samuel, excuse me, Second Samuel chapter 19. Second Samuel chapter 19. And find verse 16. In the Pew Bible, it's on page 271. 271 if you're in the Pew Bible. 2 Samuel chapter 19, verse 16. And Shemai, there he is again! And Shemai, the son of Gera, the Benjamite from Baharim, hurried to come down with the men of Judah to meet King David. And with him were a thousand men from Benjamin. And Ziba, the servant of the house of Saul, with his fifteen sons and his twenty servants, rushed down to the Jordan before the king. And they crossed the ford to bring over the king's household to do his pleasure. And Shemai, son of Gera, watch this. And Shemai, the son of Gera, fell down before the king as he was about to cross the Jordan. And said to the king, Let not my lord hold me guilty or remember how your servant did wrong on the day my Lord the king left Jerusalem. Do not let the king take it to heart. For your servant knows that I have sinned. Therefore behold I have come this day the first of all the house of Joseph. To come down to meet my Lord the king. Shemites had a little change of heart hadn't he? Verse 21. Abishai. He hadn't had a change of heart at all. Look at what he says. Abishai the son of Zerah answered, Shall not Shemai be put to death for this? Because he cursed the Lord's anointed. Look at verse 22. But David said, What have I to do with you, you sons of Zerah? He said that twice now. That you should be this day be that you should this day be an adversary to me. Shall anyone be put to death in Israel this day? For I do not know that I am this day king over Israel. And the king said to Shammai, You shall not die. And the king gave him his oath. Let's finish our point of application. With patient, excuse me, with prayer and patient persistence, don't let your critics sidetrack you. The Lord is preparing you for greater responsibility. David became king despite his critics. Can you believe it? David became king. Because he faced his critics with prayer, with persistence, with integrity, and God honored him. David became king again. David received the favor of God. And Abishai comes and says to David, here's your chance, David. Finish Shemai off. He kicked you when you were down a while back. He spread rumors about you, David. He lied about you, David. Get even with him now. And David says, no, Abishai, let's just forgive him. How could David forgive Shemai? Because he lets God take care of his critics. He lets God take care of his critics. David just gave him to God and God will deal with him. And that's exactly what happened. You see, David's job is to forgive him and give him to God. The question for us all this morning is, have we forgiven our critics? Have we forgiven our critics for the wrong that they have done to us?